come to the second and final in the two-part series of the Jamaican National Debates 2002, organized by the Jamaica Chamber of Commerce and the Media Association of Jamaica. The debate will be conducted within the format and rules agreed on by the Debates Commission and the two political parties. From the studios of the Creative Production and Training Center, the CPTC, I am Ian Boyne, your moderator for tonight's Leaders' Debate. The two participants in the debate are the Right Honorable P.J. Patterson, Attorney at Law and Queen's Council, Member of the Privy Council, Member of Parliament for Eastern Westmoreland, President of the People's National Party, and Prime Minister of Jamaica since 1992, and who has led the PNP to two consecutive victories in the general elections. The Right Honorable Edward Philip George Siago began his career as a member of the Legislative Council, now the Senate, in 1959 as the youngest member ever. He was appointed Minister of Government in 1962. Later, he became leader of the opposition and prime minister. He has been a leader of the JLP since 1974 and member of parliament for West Kingston for a record 40 years. As with the last debate, a coin was tossed earlier today to determine the order in which the participants would make their opening statement. However, the participant who is last to make his opening remarks will also close the debate. Tonight, the PNP will open, followed by the JLP. Our two panelists will direct questions to the leaders. All questions were developed solely by the panelists and are known only to them and the moderator. During the program, each team will have the time and the opportunity for rebuttals and the closing remarks. We now hear the opening remarks from Mr. Patterson. My fellow Jamaicans, next Wednesday, the people of this beautiful country will once again exercise their right to make a choice on the path we pursue and the hands which should guide the ship of state. That has been my responsibility, which I have exercised with colleagues who have sought to deal with the challenges which face every nation in the new global environment. We have at all times sought to discharge our duties and responsibilities with honesty and sincerity. Our ultimate goal being one to improve the quality of life for all Jamaicans. We have achieved a great deal, particularly in the development of infrastructure and in the social services, easing the burdens that have impacted on the less advantaged and vulnerable. We are not seeking a mandate for another term because of a search for political power as an end. We do so because we have embarked on a journey of meaningful and positive change to make our economy strong and resilient, to equip our people with the skills that a new age of technology demands. We have at all times sought to discharge our duties and responsibilities honorably, and we are ready to continue the building of our nation. Time up. Um, it's now over to you, Mr. Siago. Good evening, everyone. The Jamaica Labour Party has watched with deep concern the events that have transpired over the past 10 years or more. And over this period, we have taken note of the fact that Jamaica has had virtually no economic growth. And we're the only country in the free world with that experience. Over this period, we have borrowed much more than is readily repayable. The debt the national debt in 1988 was $33 billion. Today, it is some $600 billion, or nearly 20 times as much. Interest rates have crippled business expansion and job creation. The unemployment rate shows little or no improvement. Widespread business failures and financial failures have taken place. Forty financial institutions have collapsed. 
Virtually every sector of the economy is in decline or stagnating. Agriculture, every crop is in trouble. Manufacturing is in a continuous decline. Tourism is in crisis. Only the mining sector shows some slight ray of growth. The education system is still centered on educating a quarter of the students. Hence, three out of every 10 are illiterate when they graduate from primary school, two out of every 10 from secondary school, and seven out of 10 have no passes at all. Crime has doubled, 10,000 killed. Corruption in office has been unprecedented. Time up, and now we take our first break of the evening, but afterward we'll be back with questions from our panelists. At Red Stripe, our commitment to Jamaica goes beyond our delivery routes, venturing into areas that impact on national development and the well-being of our people. Already associated with the more playful side of life in Jamaica, Red Stripe is just as dedicated and involved in many aspects of the wider community. From donating a mobile unit to the Jamaica Dental Association and supporting the blood bank to sponsoring the Three Miles Beautification Project, we are dedicated to contributing in meaningful ways. It's our way of reaffirming our connection with the people of Jamaica. Red Stripe, investing in Jamaica, making a difference. Red Stripe, the world's coolest bear company. What Midas will do for you? What Midas does for me? I don't carry cash anymore when I do my personal business. NCB 24-hour banking. Midas! As a working mother, I love the convenience of using Midas to shop. Midas is so easy to use. I even get cash instantly. From NCB, your bank, your future. Midas! Welcome back to the Jamaica National Debates 2002. Now it's time to field questions from our panelists. With us is RGR's news editor, Moya Thomas, and Dr. Trevor Monroe, professor of government at University of the West Indies, Mona Campus, and president of the University and Allied Workers Union. Professor Monroe, you have the first question first posed to Mr. Patterson. Mr. Patterson. Former members of Parliament, Heather Robinson and Bruce Golding, have spoken of gunmen attached to the PNP and to the JLP, respectively. And in the current campaign, Jamaicans have been shot and terrorized by gunmen in the name of the JLP and the PNP. Have you personally ever seen any of your supporters with what you suspected to be an illegal gun? And what are you personally doing to detach gunmen from your party now and equally importantly, after the elections. I can say with my conscience totally clear and with the utmost veracity that I have never in the course of my political campaigning seen any person coming into my presence armed with an illegal weapon. That does not mean I do not have reason to believe or suspect that persons have in their possession illegal weapons. But I can recall my own campaign in my own constituency in 1980 when I was shot at. And when I returned to my campaign office, they said, we must be armed. And I said, if you are going to expect a slingshot from me, you will never get it. We must take a resolute position on making sure 
that gunmen and persons engaged in illegal activities do not attach themselves on the fringes of the party or seek to influence the determination of the people in the course of any election campaign. Mr. Siago? I don't think we need deny the fact that there are people who have arms that are illegal. The question that you asked is whether I, and uh, as you opposed to Mr. Patterson, have ever seen such arms in the hands of anybody who would be unauthorized to carry a weapon. And the answer to that is definitively no. The question, however, goes on to ask further, what are we doing to rid ourselves of gunmen within the ranks of the political parties? Now, a political party is a very large organization, certainly in the case of the Jamaica Labour Party, for which I speak. And no one can undertake to be able to police every nook and cranny of the membership of such parties in order to be able to say that you are ridding it of all persons who are suspected of having arms. The most that you can do is to preach the peace. The most you can do is to prevail over members not to use weapons. Just as we have been doing in the closing hours of this last campaign here, when we have said to our members, don't retaliate. There were 27 incidents committed against 26 constituencies arising out of the meeting at Halfway Tree on Sunday, on their return home, buses being stoned and buses being shot at and persons injured and hospitalized. Still, what I said to my people, bite your tongue, don't retaliate. Please make sure that we carry this campaign through to the end the way we began it. I've done 61 campaigns in constituencies and I've never had an incident except until last week when I was shot at in St. Thomas. Moyo, it's your turn to address the leaders uh, first to Mr. Siago. Mr. Siago, as the National Contracts Commission is not required to oversee the award of contracts below $4 million, there's not really much to prevent, at the very least, the perception of political manipulation when government agencies award these smaller <coughs> contracts. How would an administration under your guidance be prepared to plug those perceived loopholes? The award of public contracts is perhaps the mechanism most used for purposes of corruption. And that is why there is a limit above which there is surveillance and special consideration given to the award. Now, whether that limit should be four million or otherwise, the fact is that what we have decided to do is to empower the contractor general to enable him to sign off on every contract that is given for the public purpose. Now, obviously, he couldn't do that if the contracts were 200,000 or even a million dollars. The work would be just too much. But whether it's as much as four million, I can't say. It will require some discussion and some decision. But when he signs off, it means that he has examined the contract and in his examination, he has found the contract sum to be in order and the work program to be such that it can be fulfilled by the contractor. And in this way, we expect to cut out a great deal, if not all, of the corruption that takes place in the handing out of contracts. Mr. Patterson. In 1988, there's a very scathing report issued by the Auditor General on the award of contracts, particularly in the Ministry of Construction at that time. It is a problem that we determined should be addressed. And so we extended the powers that are available to the Contractor General by establishing a National Contracts Commission, which has the authority to oversee all contracts for goods and services above a certain size. It has to be accepted that if you were to require every single contract, no matter what the size, to be the subject of examination by a National Contracts Commission, two things would happen. You would get bogged down and there would be delays 
as a consequence of that in the whole process. And therefore, we have fixed the figure at $4 million. Already, the National Contracts Commission is suggesting that that figure is too low and is overloading their capacity to address the matters of substance. What I think we need to have further developed is a system whereby contractors are registered as they presently are now. And the Contracts Commission has the right from time to time to investigate what is happening to all contracts, no matter what their size although they do not fall under their purview initially. We now take our second break, but stay tuned, for we'll be back. Our panelists have more questions for our political leaders. We at Red Stripe honor our heritage as a Jamaican company, and in 2002, our tradition for excellence received kudos from the JMA, JEA, and the JCC, the most prestigious award being the Governor General's Award for the most outstanding corporate entity. But success doesn't just happen. It takes one team, one vision, one goal, and a drive to innovation. Innovative thinking has led us to commission MAG-5, the fastest bottling line in the Caribbean, and new product and marketing innovations, with Red Stripe Light and the new global sensation Smirnoff Ice being clear winners. Energized by our achievements, Red Stripe continues to make strides, and we're committed to being a part of Jamaica's great future. It's 10 minutes past midnight, and she's paying her utility and cable bills. Telemidas, telephone banking anytime, anywhere, for people who need more time. Telemidas, from National Commercial Bank. Welcome back to the 2002 National Debates with our leaders. Our panelists have more questions. Uh, now Trevor Monroe poses the first question to Mr. Patterson. The question of leadership has come up as a major campaign issue. Mr. Patterson, you have been described as one who consults, is non-confrontational, but who is indecisive and soft, particularly on party colleagues accused of corruption. Mr. Siaga, you have been described as one who is strong and decisive, but confrontational, intolerant of challenges from colleagues, and therefore a one-man band. Do you agree with this description, first of yourself, and second of your opponent? As Prime Minister, I am the leader of a team, but I am not a one-man band. Every person has an assigned role and is expected to perform accordingly. I consult, that is my style. I believe in building a participatory democracy. I don't happen to believe I am the repository of wisdom, all wisdom, that is. I deliberate very carefully before I come to final decisions, and I tend to take into account the widest range of opinion that extends beyond my own party. Insofar as any allegation of corruption is concerned, I challenge anyone to mention any particular case of any individual within the government 
or connected to the party that has been engaged in an act of corruption which has gone without investigation and appropriate action based on the findings. And many of the things that are being mooted as corruption have to do more with questions of man mismanagement that may be made in the course of honest decision making. When someone makes an error, one has to take responsibility for it. Corruption is a very different matter, and certainly we have not been engaged in corrupt government. Mr. Siago? There has been a great change that has taken place in the Jamaica Labour Party. Over the 1990s, it was democratized to a far greater extent than it ever was before. In previous years, I had certain decision-making powers which I exercised as part of the party regime. In the 1990s, we set about to establish teamwork and committees to take the place of the unilateral